Michael says about procrastination, the worst case of procrastination in my life right now is around exercise. I'm sure you have. You're in good company. I fall in and out of the habit, and right now I'm out of it. I don't know when I will return to it, but I'm praying for help. Michael's speech is today on food addiction, project three, incompetent communication, get to the point, five to seven minutes. And Peter, can you tell us what the objectives are? Yes. Uh, the objectives for this project are to select the speech topic and determine its general and specific purposes, to organize the speech in a manner that best achieves those purposes, ensure the beginning, body, and conclusion reinforce the purposes, project sincerity and conviction, and control how nervous as you, you may feel, and strive not to use notes, time is five to seven minutes. Thank you, Peter. At uh, the limitations are between five and seven minutes. For five minutes, the green card will go up. At uh, six minutes, the yellow card will go up. And at uh, seven minutes, the red card will go up. Thank you. Hi everyone, call me wonky, but when I get in front of a crowd like this, I like to talk about food addiction. There are several reasons for this. Some of them don't exactly do me credit. One of them is that I have an overworked sense of fairness, and I'm a bit of a know-it-all. But there's a legitimate reason in there too, and that is that food addiction is driving, helping to feed the global obesity pandemic that we're experiencing. This is a problem that is neither diagnosed, nor treated. Two groups of people are affected by this condition. The first one, of course, is addicts themselves. These are people, I say they number around 15 million American adults. That's a conservative estimate. Uh, these people are destined to a degraded quality of life on the way to an early grave. There's no other way of stating it. That's the truth. In addition to chronic physical ailments, Think what it's like to go through life having a big problem, thinking you know what the problem is, addressing it based on what you think the problem is, and failing repeatedly because you don't understand what the true nature of the problem is. This is what food addiction is. The other group affected by this is all of us. And the reason for that, as you know, we pay for our health care in shared risk pools and a study in 2008 said that we pay $147 billion every year in quote-unquote extra medical costs due to obesity. Now before I go on, I do want to make clear, I'm not saying that all of obesity is due to food addiction. It is only a contributor. It is not the only reason. That leads to some confusion, but that's the way it is. Um, and if you think the problem is only Financial, I urge you to check out the group Mission Readiness, which is made up of retired admirals, generals, and other military leaders who are worried about our national security, in part because they can't find enough people who can pass the entrance physical to the armed forces. It is a very broad-reaching problem. Now, as I said, I think that there are 15 million American adults who are food addicts. And the fact is, nobody can prove or disprove my contention because officially food addiction does not exist. The keeper of such distinctions is the American Psychiatric Association. They keep a manual called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. 
and it lists a number of substance use disorders, which is what we call addiction. There are three that deal with food, but none of them are food addiction. And this is despite a growing mountain of, of uh, scientific evidence, including MRI scans of the brain, which show that the reward center of the brain lights up when you show a suspected food addict some hyperpalatable food in the same way that the reward center of a cocaine addict lights up when you show him a pile of cocaine. You may wonder, why do I care so much about food addiction? And you may have figured out already that the reason is that I'm a recovering food addict. My top weight, recorded in 1991, was 365 pounds. I have felt the stairs of my fellow airline passengers as I walked the center aisle, each one of them praying I was not assigned to sit next to them. To address this problem, I've not only purchased first class tickets, but for one trip overseas, I purchased two coach seats. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I insisted they give me the meal that came with each seat. I felt the uh, confusion of a young Parisian as he sat with his mom next to me, uh, across from me in the uh, Paris subway. He looked at me, he looked at his mom, and then he pointed at me while looking at her, and I'm sure, I don't speak French, but I'm sure he was saying, Mommy, what happened to that man? And I felt the embarrassment after three quarters of amicable, amicable chat at a basketball game at the Harvard Civic Center, the fellow next to me said, not very meanly, you ought to pay me for half my ticket. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you've been using half my seat. In a lifetime of fatitude, I have lost hundreds of pounds, easily, literally, hundreds of pounds. But I gained it back every single time, and more, until in the mid-1980s, I was exposed to the idea that I might be more than just a fat and lazy slob, but that I might have a medical condition that could be addressed if I attacked it in a different way. And since then, my life has flowered in a number of ways. Since 1991, which is when I went into rehab in the eating disorder unit of a psychiatric hospital, my life has changed dramatically. And the big difference is, the biggest difference, is that I accepted that I was a food addict. Now, this doesn't prove that food, addi food addiction exists. It proves that when one person acted as if it did exist and accepted the treatments, practices, attitudes, and ideas that have been helping addicts recover for 75 years, my life transformed. I do have a question, uh, excuse me, a, a story, however, that, I, that does express why I'm so sure about this condition. It actually has more to do with cocaine than it does food addiction. In 1983, I moved back home to work at my hometown newspaper. And after about six months, my boss pulled me over and said, when you started, you were the sharpest guy on the desk. Now you're the one most likely to make a mistake. I don't know what happened, but you'd better fix it. Well, I knew what happened. I'd fallen in with some high school friends, and I was doing cocaine, crack cocaine, until 3 or 4 in the morning, and then trying to show up for work, ready to do business at 5 in the morning. It did not work. Now, not because of his threat, but I eventually did realize that I could have a pile of cocaine the size of this room. I would stop sleeping. I would stop going to work. I would withdraw from society almost entirely until it appeared to be gone, but then I would be crawling around on the floor looking for the last little bit. And when I realized that, I had the thought, I may as well just quit. Well, I've had that thought hundreds of times after a night of binging. I'd be bloated. I'd be queasy, I could still taste the last thing I'd put in my mouth often, and I had the thought, I may as well quit. But with cocaine, which we agree is really addictive, I had the thought, and I did. I quit, just like that. With food, I was never able to do it until I started acting like I was an addict and getting the treatment for addicts. The last thing I want to share with you is that I'm not that special. If it happened for me, it could happen for a lot of people. The first thing we must do, collectively, is agree that this condition exists. And the second thing we must do is to start helping everyone get help. Thank you.